In a moment, we're going to talk to Douglas Murray, the journalist and author, uh, about, well, why we listen to uh, these protesters. First up, let's talk to Donica McCarthy, who's a spokesman for Extinction Rebellion and joins us now. Good morning to you, Donica. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Um, How are you? What is the purpose? Well, well, I've got to be honest, I'm a little bit annoyed because I have to go through central London an awful lot and I'm, I'm a bit annoyed along with probably a lot of other people that, that because of your political views, you think you've got the right to disrupt me and other people going about our, our working day. What, what is the purpose of the protests? Um, basically, it's a, a simple thing. We watch the government to uh, fulfil uh, and pass a, a Climate Emergency Act that would call on uh, for a zero carbon uh, target of 2025 and to set up a citizens assembly to advise the government how to do this as fairly as possible. It's crucial the government tells the people the truth of the depth of the emergency that we're, we're facing and the media also. The fact is that the government is taking the opposite actions of what we need to be saving Britain from absolute terrible uh, consequences in the future. Right. just had a report from the UN, IPCC, another terrifying report that highlighted London was one of the world's biggest cities under threat from rising... Oh, when you say under threat? Correct. Under threat. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of evidence that, um, that again, I, I think a lot of people would, listening to this, would absolutely accept that they're, they're, we need to do things to tackle uh, pollution and, uh, and, and you know, get moving, moving towards renewable energy uh, as, our, as our source of energy. I, I would be fully in favour of that. But don't view things like things, you know, uh, the issue as being something about catastrophe or crisis or, or the word you use, terrifying. Um, you say we, we need, we, I mean, the three main aims of Extinction Rebellion, what we honestly, uh, government being honest about the climate's emergency. Uh, citizens' Assembly. Why do you want a Citizens' Assembly um, when we've already got a Parliament? What will a Citizens' Assembly do that's different from a Parliament? Um, because it would actually accurately reflect the, the demographic of the British public and it would be free from the vested interest. So, so will my 12-year-old be represented then? Well, well, actually, from, from 16 years upwards, obviously. But actually, at the moment, our, our, our government represents uh, and is implementing policies that support the, the banks and the oil companies are investing something like $1.6 trillion in investing in more fossil fuels. Well, of course they are, because we're still using water. fossil fuels. No, but the actual, we can't, the, 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 the international science has said we can use 20% of our current fossil fuel stocks, OK? And what's happening... They say what? Our, Apologies, say that again. We can use a fifth... Of the, of the fossil fuel resources we already have. So we can only burn a fifth of the oil stocks that we currently have. Why? Because the by burning 100% of it, we go over the limit for um, 1.5 degrees rise in temperature, which l risks runaway climate breakdown, which, as oh. David Attenborough said, and the head of the United Nations has said, mm. is incompatible with civilization as we know it. This is... An Emergency. You, you do know. You, I mean, you do know. You do know that it's been a lot warmer than 1.5 degrees uh, on Earth since we human beings have existed. Yeah, and we have had, and we've uh, existed and carried on just fine. So why would you think no, no, that? No, that's not true. We have never ever had this rise in temperature so fast. In what, what's been the rise in temperature since the Industrial Revolution? Pardon? What's been the rise in temperature in the Earth it's, since it's the Industrial been over Revolution? Over one degree centigrade. It's been under one degree centigrade. Of, and well, and, and already look at the consequences. Oh, well, aren't they wonderful? Have you not seen how wonderful the world is now in terms of fewer people starving, more people living longer, happier, healthier lives than ever before? It's a wonderful thing. Julia, I, I, I really, really, my, my heart doesn't understand where you're coming from. Well, I think the Industrial because Revolution you're, you're is the best thing that's ever being. happened to human beings because we have fewer people being. dying you're, of starvation and people live twice being. the length of their life. It's a wonderful you're, thing. You're an intelligent human being and you must look at the science. It's not climate activists are saying this. It is scientists. It is saying if we continue burning this particular oil, this particular source of energy, humanity faces extinction. That is the UN head. Now, um, I know, actually, no, I, I don't think that is what the UN... I don't think they talked about human extinction, actually. I think well, a lot of that is... Let's, 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 let me give you the exact let me, let me, uh, Can I give you the exact quote? Give me the exact quote. UN, Antonio Figueres, in an extraordinary speech in September 2018, stated unless humanity started cutting carbon emissions radically, we faced, quote-unquote, an existential crisis. 
existential mm. crisis means extinction, and that is not the UN head saying we have to have radical cuts as soon as possible. So okay, all extinction. right, I'll, I'll stand correct on that. But the, the okay. one about the, I, I do want to get to our next guest, Douglas Murray. You talk yeah. about a zero carbon uh, aim by 2025. The Labour Party currently have 2030. Uh, the Conservative Party, the Parliament, have voted for 2050. I, I personally think all three of those are insane uh, because all three of those are pretty much um, un unattainable unless we basically go back to horse and cart. We have seen a rapid fall in our carbon emissions. We've reduced carbon emissions faster than any other major advanced economy. Admittedly, That's we don't include correct. aviation and shipping, but we've cut by 44% since 1990. We still are, of, of major Julia. industrial economies, we have reduced more. Is there not an argument Julia. that you should be demonstrating outside the Chinese embassy, the American embassy, rather than cutting, uh, cutting off li road links to, for, for the British Parliament? Well, you've just given the, the, the UK government, this is the reason why we're in protesting in the heart of Parliament and heart of um, Westminster today, because government isn't telling the truth on that. Yes, internal UK emissions have gone down um, around 200 billion tonnes in the last 30 years. However, aviation, shipping and imported embedded carbon, i.e. our heavy goods are now manufactured in China, so our carbon emissions are down hardly anything in the last 30 years. And that's why we want people to tell the truth about the crisis and the lack of action by a government. The government is just is proposing £8,000 million cut in fuel duties for the fossil fuel corporations, whilst actually they have uh, destroyed the onshore wind industry and suffocated the onshore solar industry. Our government is not acting honestly and they need action. That's why okay. we're on the street today. So we've seen a massive, a massive expanse and huge amounts of our taxes paid towards it. Just finally, um, did, well, yeah. well, we, we have because I, I, I can well, see well, what well, the green carbon taxes are, are, on, are on, my, in my, on my own gas and electricity well, bills. Kind of what do you... What do you actually, that's not true either. That is, the, that is true. Your bills at home on average, are down around two to three hundred pounds, taking into account those great taxes, because your homes and our homes are more efficient. Because no, my, my home hasn't become any more efficient in recent years, because I live in a flat and I can't put any more insulation in. Let me ask you about a couple of other points, because time is against and I want to get Douglas Murray. There's been a lot of concern that cutting off Westminster Bridge is going to affect Thomas, St Thomas Hospital. It's directly it's on the south side of Westminster Bridge. Uh, there's been concerns before of people trying to get through to hospital, visit patients, ambulances getting through. Are you not concerned at all that people will be prevented from getting life saving care or visiting you know elderly sick relatives in hospital because of your protests every every day of the week in london there are protests there are nothing like this cat dams roads aren't no roads aren't are, shut no roads aren't shut down every 100, day of the week 100, 100 kilometers of road are closed for the for the marathon we have been liaising very carefully with the police and with the emergency services. So there will be access to St. Thomas's Hospital because we actually share those concerns. You're absolutely, that's going to be fine. And just finally... But however, we must remember, every day of the week in London, 24 people die from fossil fuel pollution. No, they don't. Again, that's a complete lie. They simply don't. That's, that's, simply, that's simply a lie. Just finally, I want to ask you, Donica, um, there'll be lots of people listening to this that will simply say, look, you have these views and you want to push these views. You're very passionate about it. You need to go and sit on the streets for two weeks. I have to say, small point, does anyone have a job involved in this? Um, because most of us have to actually be at work most days. But also, why don't you stand for election? Why don't you put a manifesto forward? Why don't you stand for election? We're going to have a general election really soon. If the people are behind you and your message is clear and you're getting a lot of, lot of, lot of interviews on the media, why don't you stand for election and let the British people decide? OK, two points first. First of all, you said it was untrue about people dying. The NHS... If you think you're better than the NHS... I'm no, I can assure you, I've read the original report. That's not what it claims. We're going to have to move on from that. I need okay, you to well, answer the I'll question about an election. I can 100% assure you that. that fact is not true. Well, OK, I will set the NHS light. However, on the point of democracy, in London, people have voted for decades for people in... for MPs in South East London for mayors in, South, in, in, in London and for prime ministers who all promised us they would not expand Heathrow Airport. We have tried the democratic route and it has failed us. Democracy, shockingly in this country, is betraying the people's desire for a, a cleaner, a cleaner, low-carbon society. We've tried it. So at this point, you just go to the streets and you just, you just have, you have mass civil disobedience because you think that. I mean, what should, should Brexit? Should people who voted for Brexit go on the streets as well, given that democracy has failed them? Well, should they? We live in a democracy. If, if, if they wish. Well, you just said we didn't live in a democracy. Can. Well, well, in terms of we have the right still, in, to a limited extent, to protest.
Well, you have a right to peaceful protest. This is peaceful protest, but it's not going to be lawful protest because obstructing the highway isn't lawful. You're not going to be going around smashing things up, although, I mean, a lot of people gluing themselves to doors and causing damage is criminal damage. But but it's not it's not peaceful for the people who are trying to make their way to and from work. It's not peaceful for the people whose bus routes are cancelled and the like, is it? It doesn't feel peaceful to them. Well, it is peaceful in terms that we are non-violent. We're dedicated Gandhian principles of non-violence. Gandhi saw to actually change the system that was actually trashing India's economy and health, that he did mass peaceful non-violent but, but directions. did so you not have access... You, you have access to the ballot box, though. Yeah, but I've actually said it's failed us. But you're, you're saying not enough... But no, basically what you're saying is not enough people are voting for you because you haven't got public support, so you're going to force people to listen. That's what you're saying, isn't no, it? We're, no, we're actually saying that Britain is facing an existential crisis and the complacency of the public and the government needs to be waken up by peaceful... We've got thousands of people coming to London. Doctors, You have thousands lawyers, of people not coming to London. We've got doctors, lawyers, nurses, professors, um, workmen, bus drivers who yes. actually understand... But what, 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 20 to 30,000 people on the streets. They well, that's so 65 that million who aren't on the streets. They're so concerned that they'll be willing to jeopardise their future careers because they understand the crisis mm. we're in. And, Julia, please, okay. imagine if you're wrong on, on your analysis of the science. What does that mean for our kids and the future of Britain? It is we a are the world. We, I mean, I, th I always want to start singing when people start saying that because it's sort of... I'm happy to have a really sensible debate about the science and the economics, economics of this and, what, and the political solutions. But what I don't want to have is either people just getting hysterical and sending 16-year-old children out to do their work. And I don't like people forcing people to listen by basically basically going out in civil disobedience. I don't think that's what we do in a democratic society. OK, well, if, if a building's on fire and people don't We're know... We're not on fire. Somebody, well, actually, sorry, Julia, in, in, oh. from the science, we are. And then you talked about the economics. OK, let's talk about the economics. That's something that wouldn't hurt anybody. In the next five to ten years, the oil companies are proposing to invest 5,000 billion dollars brilliant. in finding new fossil Excellent. fuels. Excellent. Brilliant. Finding well, new cleaner fossil well, fuels, like, like like fracking and the like. Brilliant. It's going to be a cleaner fossil fuel. We're going, do you know what, Donica? We're going to get you in the studio at some point and we're going to do this for much longer because we are so over time. Haven't got to talk to Douglas Murray yet, who's waiting very patiently on the line. You wrote a, a, a very interesting piece in the papers over the weekend uh, about Extinction Rebellion. I suppose the, the fair summary of it is, why are we listening to these people? So why are we? Well, I do think, I have to say... Um, that this is an unalloyed example of fanaticism that we're hearing. Uh, a fanaticism which is just undisguisable. Uh, it's been undisguisable in every age and it's undisguisable in this one when it, when it appears. People who think that they know so much better than everyone else that they are willing to actually risk the lives of everyone else, uh, willing to cut off hospitals, willing to sort of vaguely think after the fact about things they hadn't thought before they spoke. Uh, willing to shut down cities, willing, let's just look at their most important claim, willing to completely immiserate the economy, completely immiserate and it. And this is the 2025, 2025 zero carbon emission target. This would involve, and again, there's so much to get through. I didn't get to all of it with Donica McCarthy. Time's always against you in these interviews. But but this this would involve, I and mean, again, the Labour policy is 2030, the Tory policy 2050 now, but we are talking about changing our economy so drastically. I mean, to all intents and purposes, unachievable unless, say, for instance, we all, we all stop having cars, diesel, petrol, even electric cars, stop flying, uh, stop eating meat, uh, stop heating our homes. We were talking about a mass change in the way we live our lives. Right. And every single thing they claim uh, is either untrue or has absolutely no context to it or can be easily countered by a, a simple point to, to, to highlight something else. For instance, uh, uh, even if their claims about the number of people they claim are dying because of the current situation, which are wild claims, even if they were the case, look at the fact that the means of, of, of global economic growth that we have at the moment, the capitalist system, which Extinction Rebellion explicitly says it wants to destroy, uh, it, it, the, that, that system of growth has raised around a half of people around the world who were suffering from absolute poverty, out of absolute poverty in the first decade of this century alone. So when they when they describe the system of economic growth, 
which has done such an extraordinary and miraculous thing in our own recent lifetimes as being the cause of so much suffering and death. There is so little that they put out there that even begins to counter the fanatical claims that they are making. Um, do you think that it, too much attention is being paid to them? Because to a certain extent, their tactics are working rather well, aren't they? They're all in the media. We're discussing there'll be all of their antics and uh, you know the people dancing around boats in silly outfits on bridges. That's going to be all over the TV news. They are yes. setting the agenda. It's, I mean, it's working. Do you think governments shouldn't be giving in to this sort of pressure? Well, I don't think government is giving in to pressure. There are some political parties that are trying to piggyback on the on the claims. And I think that certainly politicians have been finding it incre incredibly difficult uh, to voice any opposition to sort of Greta-ism, uh, which is obviously another wing of this at the moment. Uh, and I, I explain why I think that is. It's basically been set up to be impossible uh, to uh, oppose and be still regarded as a decent person in mainstream politics. But if you shut down major cities, you should not be able to do so unopposed. Uh, um, clearly, Extinction Rebellion are not entirely cooperating with the police because there was a police raid on their headquarters in London on Saturday. If they were cooperating, the police wouldn't have raided one of their headquarters. But, but the other point about this is that clearly there is a campaigning tactic to say the, the most extreme and outlandish thing imaginable, i.e. we're all going to die very soon. Maybe some of them believe it, maybe a lot of them do. But the point is, is that from a campaigning point of view, if you make such an outrageous set of claims as Extinction Rebellion are making, you do get people's attention. And at the very least, you are likely somewhere along the line to create some kind of compromise, i.e. some people will say, well, maybe not everyone's going to die, maybe a third of us, or so on, to yeah. be fatuous about so it. So they, they, change, the they move the over to the window, really, don't they? Where is Sadiq Khan? He's been very quiet. He's been as quiet as a mouse. You have people who've closed down London, make it almost impossible to get to certain hospitals, um, can't get to work, and he has had nothing to say. His statement has been him telegraphing his virtue, which I think is terrible. What Londoners need is someone's going to stand up for him. This is a time we'd expect the mayor to appear and do something. That's where I have to start, and i tell you why. Yesterday, I went to Westminster Bridge and I met some of people who were protesting. Really good-natured protests, really strong points about climate change, sea level, single-use plastics, all that kind of stuff. My, myself and my son, we're both asthmatic, so we're, we're focused on these issues. But I had to say to someone, but look, you're, you're affecting just my ability to go to work. Is that right? And then the other thing that really made, my, made me look at what's going on when I was on Westminster Bridge, there was a guy carrying his tools across the bridge. So I said to him, what are you doing? He said, well, I have to get to work. He said, let's be clear, Sean, I have a job. If I don't work, I don't get paid. That's I can't a lot have of people this. in that position. Exactly. He said, I can't have this for two weeks. And that's why I make a strong ask of the mayor. Where are you? And the crucial thing to remember is, again, although policing, you know, is going to the Metropolitan Police mm -hmm. Chief, Cresta Dick, actually the oversight of policing, the decisions about uh, funding and the number of police, that is set by the London Mayor. It's one of the key powers that a London Mayor does have. He is a police and crime commissioner for for London, but let's be clear, uh, the, the mayor could have went to the police and also Extinction um, Rebellion because we've known that they were coming and he could have said, look, you, your issues are correct. You do have the right to protest. Can we organise this so you don't bring London to a standstill? Because as much as you have the right to protest, you don't have the right to destroy people's lives. Well, no, this lives. is it. Everyone keeps talking about this right to protest. Now, they admit they say these are peaceful protests. I, I, I dispute. They're not violent. They're not mostly. Some mm. people are, are damaging, um, you know, shop fronts and things. But, but, but yes, largely they are peaceful. But they're not legal protest. You don't have a right to illegal protest. You have a right to have a march. You can contact the police. You can. They said they'd been uh, de dealing with the police and everything's all fine, but there wouldn't have been raids on various uh, mm. uh, people's homes and, uh, and uh, warehouses mm -hmm. to confiscate goods if that were the case, if the police felt they were fully cooperating. But you don't have a right to shut down major arterial routes in the capital city of this country. That's not a right that is conferred in our democracy. And, and, and the other thing as well, I, I was speaking to people yesterday. To, to, to do, I spoke to two guys and about four or five different women who seemed really, really well educated, really well focused. And I had to say to, to one to, to to one couple I spoke to, "Do you think you're making people who are not climate aware 
support this issue because I want to support it. I'm constantly trying you to learn support, about You don't it. support the aims of no, Extinction no, no. Rebellion. I, I, I know. I want to learn about climate change. I want to learn about how we make our environment cleaner. But if you do these kind of things, it turns people off and you don't have the right to make demands. Some of the things that they're asking for are, are basically going around politics and saying, just give us these things. You have to go through it the long way. Believe you and me, I know about much. <laughs> Someone trying to get yeah, elected. The yeah. long way through politics. I, I just think that we need a much more reasonable debate here and that debate could be could be started by a mayor stepping up. Well, I mean, you've got Boris Johnson, the, the Conservative Prime Minister, has talked about the Extinction Rebellion protesters' uncooperative crusties yesterday. He said uh, they should abandon their hemp-smelling bivouacs and stop blocking roads. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that he needs to be uh, uh, insulting to them. Although, I mean, I, say, I think a lot of what they're arguing, asking for is, is completely lunacy, absolute lunacy. But I think they're, they're well-meaning. But there does seem to be a view now that because people feel passionately about something, whatever it is, that that's okay for them to then force their protests and, and, and okay, peacefully, sometimes not peacefully, uh, a, 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 a impact on other people's lives because they feel passionately. Do you think that the government, I mean, the Theresa May, the former Prime Minister until uh, July this year, uh, she basically agreed to a, a 2050 net zero emissions uh, target. Um, Labour committed to 30, the 2030 target. Extinction Rebellion, what a totally, un, I mean, impossible to deliver 2025 target. Um, but but should should governments be paying so much lip service to this saying, oh well their aims are good look, their aims are they are these are anarcho communists who want to tear down democracy and who don't actually respect the democratic norms that they say, well, we can't get elected, so we're not going to try that way, we're going to make demands. Should we be paying lip service and paying and, and treating with respect people who act in this way and try and go outside the bounds of normal democratic conversation? Look, we have the means and, and the wherewithal to protect our democracy and people have to operate within that. As someone who, who stood for parliament, council and all kinds of stuff, I understand that and I hope people at Extinction Rebellion would stand that because if they don't, what they'll end up with is people fighting against them instead of them making their point. And the fact that you're passionate about something certainly does not give you the right to disrupt other people's lives. I cannot have this conversation and, and, and not mention the fact that we had, we've had we had an acid attack and a stabbing in, in the last 24 hours and what's happened here is you've had the police who've had to focus on something else in very large numbers so they can't do their day job which is keeping us safe. And the police have said repeatedly that actually the biggest single um, uh, demand on them this year has been Extinction Rebellion, their various protests and threat and protests. And that, of course, is keeping police off the streets protecting people when we've had had this horrific uh, spate of knife attacks in this city. Exactly. And, 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 and across the country. The, the, this the isn't thing, just a, a London problem. The thing about knife crime, the police, one of their greatest tactics is is, is ever present. They need to be ever present. And this is, is stopping it. And of course, the last protest cost £16 million to the police. I do believe that if you're Extinction Rebellion, you do have to have some kind of reasonable approach as well. You'll turn people off. And part of that reasonable approach is protesting in ways that don't bring London to a standstill. Okay. Okay. I say again, there are people in London who will not get paid if they can't move around. It's not fair to do that. To Why them. are you and so many of the people who are taking part in these protests uh, not actually obeying the uh, Public Order Act uh, order from the police to stop blocking roads and to move to a pedestrianised area? Have your protests, get all the uh, uh, get all the uh, TV coverage, but actually allow everyone else to go about their daily business. Well, the, the problem is the status quo is the thing that we, we understand can't continue. So going about daily business is the thing that we're here to uh, disrupt. And um, we, we are, to be honest, very sorry for the disruption that we cause to ordinary people. Are you? But it's the government. That, yes, actually. And, and that's why, I mean, Animal Rebellion, we went to Smithfield Market. We entered into dialogue with Smithfield. Uh, many of the traders sort of welcomed us there. Many weren't happy. That is fair. But we actually entered into a, tr a dialogue with Smithfield to make sure that we didn't blockade any of the um, workers. When you say you entered into a dialogue, yes. um, you, you basically took over a lot of the market, set up your own stalls, selling things, actually not, not having a licence. Anyone else would be prosecuted for that in this city, uh, by the way. But um, you didn't enter into a dialogue. You forced a dialogue on people who no. were going about their daily business by just simply well, no, turning we up. Sat down with, we sat down with um, Smithfield 10 Market Tenants Association and had a couple of really good discussions about what their concerns were and what ours were. So, Mm -hmm. And many of them, and many of them recognised that the reasons why we were doing it, which is about the climate emergency, were for valid reasons. And I think that's what's really important here. Is like we need to focus on the climate emergency. I mean, I'm staying with friends at the moment. I've just popped back to have a shower down in Clapham. Well, that's good news. Well, it's very nice for me. Yeah, but the nine-year-old who's going to school is doing a 
presentation at her assembly on climate change, and she knows more about the science than some of the politicians who are That's inactive funny because on the subject. I, I, most, judging having spoken to quite a lot of children about climate change, most of them only know the absolute hysteria that they're told by a lot of times by the media and by organisations like yours and have very mm. little knowledge of the facts, uh, which is one of my concerns. You talk about this being a climate emergency. Um, there is a very strong argument, if you believe that, that you should form a political party and you should stand for election and, you know, they're going to be having a general election very soon, stand candidates in every uh, uh, in every constituency, put your case, have your, get your leaflets, do your party political broadcast and, like, and get your message over and, and convince either other politicians or convince voters to vote for you. Is that not a, a rather more appropriate way to go about dealing with things than just sort of dancing and singing in a market or, or, or on a bridge, causing disruption to ordinary people going about their daily business and I'm, I'm trying to get to and from work and unable to do so because of it, um, and, 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 and terrifying everybody with silly words like climate emergency. Wouldn't it be better to have a sense debate and put your 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 uh, arguments forward uh, in a, in the de as part of the democratic process well in may parliament declared a climate and ecological emergency so it's not really silly words if well you, it was ridiculous when they did it as well because so, there isn't a climate well, okay. emergency but well well yeah. you can't have it both ways can you julie you can't say we need to form a political party and then say the political parties who, who declared an emergency are, are ridiculous. yes, I, so, yes I can i can absolutely well, say both of those things Yes, but well, you can say them, but they. So don't I'm, really I'm make allowed sense. to disagree with political political statements by politicians. Yes, that's literally what the point of democracy is. Yes, I'm allowed yes, to do but, that. Okay, fine. But what you're basically what you're basically saying is that actually, the United Nations, the Royal Society of Arts and their Food Farming and Climate Commission, um, and 24,000 scientists who declared that we need to act now, not in 2050. We're basically we we are we have the science on our side. And we have the clear sense of like an emergency that's happening now that we need to react to. Not in, not, in, not in 30 years, but now. And that's why we are taking these desperate steps. And we are ordinary people taking desperate steps. And sometimes they're dance steps because we need a bit of uplifting in this really dire time. And that's why we're on the streets. And I think a lot of ordinary people, as, as proven by the research that was done after the April rebellion, was that like sixty-two percent of the public were on our side? Oh, but that. Oh, but uh, now this emergency. is the thing. If you, yeah, if you, but if you ask those people what they are actually, again, you don't have aims. You have demands. What the demands of these protesters are, uh, and they actually knew the actual effects on their lives as a result of those demands. I think you'd probably cut that support down to about ten percent. If people genuinely do back your views, why is there only one Green Party MP sitting in Parliament? Oh, well, I mean, well, yes, but well, that's because we've got a um, first past the post system, actually. You know. Okay. Well, you, okay. Then why? A, no, no. Then why weren't? Why? System, oh, we, we know. We at the European elections, party. at the European yeah. elections in May, uh, we we don't use the first past the post system. We use uh, the PR system. Why did we not have sixty-two percent of uh, of uh, MEPs elected uh, who support uh, who supported your port cause then? Because it's not the only issue, and we know this. So we know it's not the only issue, and because. You know, Brexit is dominating our political um, uh, sphere at a time when we really, really need to be focusing on our planet. There will be no jobs, there will be no security, there will be no food sovereignty, there will be no no assurances of sort of like the life that we have right now on a dead planet. And Alex, that's how we need to act. Alex, except uh, with all due respect, and I so appreciate you talking to us, everything you just said then was complete, unverifiable, unscientific, absolute nonsense. This is this is a this is a religious cult, not a not a not a political cause. I'm, I'm afraid it isn't, and I think a lot of people realise There's that. There's no science backing up anything up you just center. said. People, people, well, people should They're be like, concerned you, about burning of fossil fuels and carbon that. emissions, but that's a completely different thing from saying the whole planet's going to die, we're going to die, there'll be no... That, there's no evidence for making any of those claims whatsoever. There, there is significant evidence in the IPCC report about these, these the dire states of our planet and the tipping points and the tipping acceleration points that will now get worse unless we take significant okay. action to change the status quo right, now. Alex. And that's why we're calling for what we're doing and that's why we're out okay. there. We're just that's actually, I have found the IPCC report is is not anything like as uh, catastrophic as, as is often claimed. I wonder if actually many people have actually read those reports. Uh, Alex Lockwood from Animal Rebellion, who was at Smithfield's Market yesterday. It's all part of a dialogue uh, moving to Westminster Day. But don't worry, he has had a shower and he's promising less dancing. So that's got to be a good thing. Uh, let's now talk to Brendan O'Neill. He's editor of Spiked Online. Um, Brendan, you and I have spoken about this before. And uh, I know you've been writing quite vociferously uh, about uh, these issues. Um, um, this is, we're told, look, this is about... 
look, we should be disrupting daily business, says Alex Lockwood, because actually we need to disrupt our daily lives because that, you know, that is how we get everyone's attention and because this is going to cause a massive disruption to our lives. What would you say to that? I, I think that's complete nonsense. And I think actually the disruption of ordinary people's lives is, is not a byproduct of these protests. It's the aim of these protests because... These kinds of protesters, who I do think come off like an extremist religious cult with their prediction of the end of the world and the fire that is going to consume mankind, and they're handing out leaflets saying, the truth, the truth, this is the truth, you know, like those kind of hysterics in the past who said the end is nigh. So they are like a cult. And, and really, they save their ire mostly for ordinary people. They think we eat too much meat. They think we fly too much. They think we're polluting horrible creatures. And so... The disruptive nature of these protests is the whole point of these protests. Um, and, uh, the argument, though, that, that they actually are having quite a big impact is is fair, though. They are having a huge impact. We have seen this declaration, instead of a climate emergency in Parliament um, earlier this mm. year, again, I thought absolute, just simply a, a statement of absolute nonsense, not, again, not backed up by the actual science in the IPCC reports and in the actual science backing up those IPCC reports, uh, but also um, the fact that the government has now taken on this 2050 target for zero net carbon emissions. Uh, Labour Party wanted a 2030 target, Extinction Rebellion's target, 2025. And again, just in six years' time, and, and, I've, and we talked about it on the show so many times, the reality of that would mean people basically not even be able to heat their homes. Mm. That's, this is the most shocking thing about Extinction Rebellion. It's not the group itself. It's how seriously politicians treat them. I mean, this week we've had Barry Gardner and Clive Lewis and others saying that they love Extinction Rebellion. Uh, the thing is... Let's not beat around the bush. These people are crazy. And I use that word advisedly. If we followed their plan, if we implemented their demands, people would be plunged into poverty. You, as you say, it would be hard to heat your home if we were to rip out all carbon emissions by 2025. There'd be hardly any driving. Uh, electricity would be switched off. In fact, there was an Extinction Rebellion person on TV on Sunday moaning about how much electricity there is in a city like London. They want to propel us back to the Stone Age. This is really crazy stuff. And the, the great irony is that leftists in this country will go into a meltdown if the Tories close down a library in Wolverhampton. They'll say this is the most evil form of austerity you could imagine. And yet they support this group, which genuinely wants to propel people into a kind of pre-modern state of existence. So there's a real element of hip hip hypocrisy. If you want to see what severe, grinding austerity would look like, just follow Extinction Rebellion. Um, and I mean, just finally, uh, why do you think uh, the government and indeed the media uh, take this all so seriously? Because uh, I was watching a reporter on the television this morning who was sort of tiptoeing around the tents in Westminster, people on the streets. Okay, I leave my bin out a day early. I get fined. Someone pitches a tent in the middle of the road. Uh, they, they, the police stand around and guard them. Uh, and, uh, and apparently the police not being allowed to use uh, angle, uh, angle grinders to remove people because they, they can't wake people up in a residential area, people are sleeping in the street. Uh, but also a reporter actually saying, oh, I should talk more quietly because people are sleeping. Now, I'd be there with my liar tailor and my hose if it was my street, I'm going to be honest with you. But why do you think the government pays so much lip service and why do you think the media does? Because I wonder if, if this was, say, Brexiteers who were out marching in the streets and causing disruption and doing this, I have a funny feeling the policing of it would be rather different. Exactly right. And it's because these people are seen as good protesters. I mean, they are predominantly middle class. They're very hippie-ish. They're dancing around the streets, you know, and they have this message that unfortunately many politicians agree with, this kind of apocalyptic vision of the future being really horrible, which is complete bunkum. Uh, but as you say, you know, if it was Brexiteers, as it was earlier this year at the Leave Means Leave rally that you and I both spoke at, and the, the po protesters who gathered there were looked upon with complete contempt by people like Jon Snow at Channel 4 and other people in the media, whereas these protesters are celebrated, even though they are doing really, really annoying things like yoga sessions. <laughs> Genuinely, that, that, that's the bit that really got me. Right now, we're going to talk about the Extinction Rebellion protests ongoing. Day five of uh, two weeks of those protests in London, uh, large parts of Westminster, basically have Tent City, uh, Westminster Bridge, Lambeth Bridge uh, having been uh, closed off for some days. Uh, City Airport now the uh, subject of uh, some attention with protesters, not just in planes, uh, stopping them leaving by refusing to sit down while they video 
radio themselves and apologising to passengers for causing disruption as they themselves choose to cause disruption. And indeed, a, a par former paraplegic uh, sportsman uh, clinging to the top of an aeroplane yesterday, uh, stopping it from taking off. I'm not quite sure uh, uh, how the police allowed that to happen. But um, we were going to be talking to Michaela Loach, who's a climate change activist from Extinction Rebellion Scotland. Unfortunately, uh, she didn't realise it was going to be me interviewing her. And because apparently I don't share her views on uh, how we tackle the issue of climate change, she didn't want to be interviewed by me. Um, I, I don't know if the rule is uh, is different to different parts of the country, Michaela, but I, I think as a general rule, we're able to have conversations with people uh, on the British media uh, where we don't necessarily always agree. And if you can't stand up for your own arguments when asked simple questions in a radio studio, then I'm not really sure you should put yourself up forward as a spokesperson for your group. But we have managed to find someone who's uh, got rather more gumption about him. We've spoken to him before, Zach Polanski, who's an Extinction Rebellion member, and he has joined us now. Good morning to you, Zach. Julia, ever the light to speak well, in the morning. Well, there we are, you see. You can do, I've never understood. It's the same with Remain and Brexit as well. I've never understood why people feel uh, difficult to talk to other people who have different views. Um, uh, but what do you make of uh, people who say they don't want to uh, go on uh, shows with people who they... Well, actually, apparently she called me a climate denier. I've never really understood what climate denier means. Uh, I just want someone who just wants to discuss the science and wants to discuss uh, what, you know, what the options are about how we tackle issues around our climate. But um, should we be uh, not talking talking to people who disagree with us? Um, I think we need to talk to everyone and I think we always need to have conversations. I think it's only fair to recognise that when you're on the media and you have a platform, you do, Julia, you're more powerful uh, in terms of influence than a lot of your individual activists. So while I encourage and thank you for this platform to be able to speak to things, because I think if you're going to be spouting stuff for three hours every day or however long your show well, is... I love that it. you're speaking and I'm spouting. That's an interesting... <laughs> Difference, well, you do it? spout a little bit, don't you, Julia? Do Sometimes you? you come up with, you know, outrageous statements that you know will get ratings, like you what? know will go viral Can on we... YouTube. No, no, um, I know. I, I hate to tell you, I, I only just, I only give my actual views, and if, just because you disagree with them doesn't mean they're spouting. But let's let's talk about these protests because there's been a new poll that suggests that actually more than half you of people. You spout beautifully, by the way. It's I not, do. You know, not a criticism. Sorry, I'm very go on, good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I, generally, I think I think the idea that when people are giving views that aren't the same as someone else's, it just it, it could just be people giving views that aren't the same as yours. It's all it all it's all it could be. But, look, let's, but let's, do not let's, think there's a line where you look at it and you're feeding the machine. You're kind of saying, well, that's you now I'm complicit. Complicit in making, with what? Um, well, then you're, I'm giving you content, aren't I? So I have to consider when I come on, is this something that I want to support? Is it something I want to be complicit? And when I weigh up those two things, I think actually, yes, it's better to complicit be able to what? have a platform. With giving you a forum and a bigger platform to be able to kind of... I've got my own national radio show. I don't need a bigger forum. Well, this is the thing. I thought you were a little bit shaky on Question Time last night, and I respect Did the fact that it's very difficult to go on a national TV um, when you're used to your own radio show because suddenly someone else is hosting it. But I noticed that you weren't quite as confident and quite as cutting as you usually are on your show. And I just really, thought I, that's I, interesting when you think, have to share a platform. I think, I, well, I think it's very different presenting a show to being a guest on a show and a Agreed. panel of, of, of five people. So obviously you're sharing the time in a rather different way than a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, but 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 also, um, I, I don't think many people, given the, some of the responses I've had on Twitter overnight, would share your view on that. But look, let's, let's talk about some well, actual... Well, we know Twitter, Twitter's an echo. Chamber, how, Zach, so the people well, exactly, support you. Zach, how about we actually talk about some substance rather than yes, just what you think that. of me? I'm not sure even my own listeners care that much what, what anyone thinks of me or even what they think of me, but there we are. Um, yeah, I don't think my husband cares that much either. Um, but you know, let's let's talk about the Extinction Rebellion tactics because yeah. one of the conversations that did come up on, on Question Time was about the choice of tactics. A lot of people who may be very sympathetic to your cause um, may not actually like the tactics of putting a lot of people in disruption, uh, stopping, you know, stopping people from going about their daily business uh, driving their cars, uh, getting their bus, walking where they want to walk, and indeed getting aeroplanes from city airport. Uh, some 53%, I think, in the survey such in the UGov carried out said that they didn't actually approve of the tactics that Extinction Rebellion were doing and thought that actually you were putting people off. Do you think that's a risk? Yes, I think it's a massive risk. Um, I think whenever you take any civil disobedience, you have to think very seriously and weigh up the calculation between how important is the cause, how important is the 
um, media attention that's going to be caused by this cause and how much can we impact that media attention to make sure that's actionable change. This can't just be about getting attention because then it's attention seeking in the worst possible way. It has to be attention seeking, making sure that we're getting actionable plans from it. Um, I think that it probably is putting some people off, but then I think that's why it's important I come on shows like Talk Radio where your listeners on average might not entirely agree with our tactics and make sure they're presenting a reasonable case. So if I'm presenting a reasonable case, we are facing an existential crisis. And if we have to inconvenience some people to do that, including ourselves, that is something we have to apologize for. And that's something though also we have to do and, and keep saying we are doing this because we want the government to make our three demands. Well, you see, well, again, and it demands not aims. And, and again, this is the bit I'm worried about. Is that, And again, I'm very forced about this on Question Time. I don't like the fact that this is an organisation that's not been elected by anybody, uh, not sort of the ballot box uh, and got representation from the people to make demands of the government. I don't think that's something that we do in a democracy, and certainly not by force. And yes, although not violent protests, these are not legal protests. They are, they are actually causing inconvenience. They are against the law. We've seen a thousand plus people being arrested because these protests aren't legal and are causing uh, problems for people. Um, but uh, you, know, you could stood for you could If this is such an important issue and people really care about it and, and your arguments are so persuasive and the facts are on your side, you would be able to persuade people at the ballot box. And the reality is that you're not. I mean, even in the European elections with the Green Party, who, who are not even remotely as extreme as Extinction Rebellion, and you are an extremist organisation, uh, only 11.8% votes. Now, a heck of a lot more than they got at the last general election and all played to them. But um, this is a minority interest. This is a min as minority support, as much as people pay lip service. If people actually knew what would be required to achieve what Extinction Rebellion wanted to do, you'd have barely anyone signing up to it. Well, an Ipsos poll just showed us that 53% of people uh, thought climate change was the most important issue. That's gone up to 79%. Sorry, not the most important issue, but an important issue. That's gone up to 79%. That's a very crucial difference, isn't it? It is, and I think that's a fair distinction. So we've got some more work to do there. But it's clearly, I think even you would argue, that's moving in the right direction if you care about climate change. Oh, no, I know. I would um, say it's moving in the wrong direction because I don't think it is the single biggest issue. So... Do you think it's an important issue? I think it's an important issue to be tackled. I think mostly it's an important issue to be tackled in terms of moving to renewables and, and moving towards a more sustainable future. Absolutely, that I have absolutely signed up but to that. Julia, how I'm not. I don't. Can we move towards a more renewable future mm. while expanding airports, for instance, or how specifically can we move towards because a we renewable are, future? Because we are because technology. While you're championing fracking. Oh, absolutely! Fracking is incredibly clear, clean energy. Since we do, since we are unable to at the current time and for the foreseeable future rely entirely on renewable energy forms because we haven't got the technology that reliable enough, yeah? Fracking is a very, very clean version of fossil fuels. It's the cleanest available um, other than moving to nuclear. But your organisation is opposed That's to nonsense. fracking, it's opposed to nuclear, you're opposed to everything. No, but the, the big concern is we are we, we, we are developing technology all the time that is cleaner, cleaner aeroplanes, cleaner cars. This is all going to happen anyway. The key thing is everything that Extinction Rebellion is talking about is based on the idea that we are facing imminent destruction and catastrophe. Uh, we've, we've got people talking about an Extinction Rebellion protest yesterday on air talking about how we have only two more human civilizations, two more generations of human civilization left. This is abject nonsense and none of it is backed up by the science, none of it is backed up by the IPCC reports at all and yet you're making these claims that we're in a catastrophe situation an existential battle. We're simply not. There's no science that suggests that whatsoever. Um, why do you have a problem? I'm going to come back to that. There's a, you asked it's me about four questions point. all at once. And yeah, exactly. So why, why do you have a problem, first of all, with it demands, not aims? I don't think that's particularly radical extremist. I think that's Demands? Just you have no right yeah. to demand anything from a democratically elected government. Well, you can, you can seek to persuade people. people. Well, this is the thing. So we have a You're not persuading people, system. you're bullying people. I don't think we're bullying people at all. I'm a very mild-mannered person. I think most extinction rebellion activists, the idea that bullying... But apart from the fact I that you're stopping people laughable. getting flights and, and getting buses across bridges and, and going about their lawful business, that's bullying. Well, you could argue, actually, that we want to have a conversation with government and, and we have an unfair voting system. We're not being heard by democracy. No, so actually, no, no, PR, no right under the PR heard. system, the European elections, 1.8 million votes went to the Green Party. That's a vote where there's no... It's not first past the post, but... No, but tackle, tackle the issue. Well, you're Why making my point for me there, Julia. You're doing it brilliantly. If we had a proportional representation system at general You'd elections... You'd still only have less than 12% no of the cost. vote. But you still wouldn't be in government because you've not persuaded people. You're, tr you're trying to bully people rather than persuade people of your well, arguments under, because the actual the facts of, don't back up your you're arguments. You're just shouting at me now. This is a bit bullying. This I'm is what I meant by shouting. shouting. You're doing it right now. We're not having I'm, a I'm, I'm Am I shouting? No, that was I, a, no I, I'm not shouting. No. I, I think it's quite loud. Um, 
<laughs> I, we don't, we've not had a fair voting system for generations, certainly in our lifetimes. That means in that context, people think that the Green Party is a wasted vote. I think at European elections, we're now proving under a proportional representation system, you can have green okay. representation. Ta- no, people enjoy that green representation. And you got 12, and you got, the Green Party got 12%, but that's not a majority. It says that, that is, most people didn't vote for the Green Party. Come on, come on to the argument that I've made that I think this is bullying rather than trying to persuade people. And the reason is because you, you don't have the facts, the science, the IPCC reports backing up what you want. Um, We're a non-violent, peaceful protest. I think anyone listening to this, if they're going to be reasonable, knows that that's not bullying. There is no coercion in it. This is about people coming together and everyone is welcome. Any of your listeners are welcome to go to rebellion.earth, the website, and take part in a vote that's happening right now in Trafalgar Square, um, which is about where is the next action going to be today? Is it going to be to block Waterloo Bridge? Is it going to be aimed at government uh, departments? Or is it going to be aimed at the city? And then those votes are going to happen. Then people are going to have a discussion about where are we with our demands? What are the things we want to be making? And then if we can get government representation to come down, we'll have an open discussion with them and make negotiations. Okay. That's well, not can I, can, I, can I give you my vote? You give me my proxy. My proxy vote is that you, you actually lobby governments and you, you stand for election. Uh, well, and I'm definitely you, doing that. I've yeah, no, no, but so that's what you do. My boyfriend's but, like, are you ever not going to be well, running for election? Well, that's, that's brilliant. You should do that. And absolutely, I want you know, people to have a chance to vote for your policies. And things. But, but, but I just don't think because you... You haven't done that yet, and because you haven't put those uh, those issues to the British people, I, I'm not sure you should be uh, in a situation where you are effectively bullying people. Uh, can I by ask you a question? Will you join yeah. me in lobbying for proportional representation? Do you no, think maybe I no, I believe in the first past the post away. system, but you know, I'm, I've always been very open about that because that's how I think you get a strong and stable government. But if your if your policies had genuinely did have proper support, uh, then uh, then you, then we would uh, we would they would already have been taken on board. And indeed, the Labour Party 2030 uh, target and the uh, Tory Party. 2050 target have already taken on board and yet you're still on the streets causing disruption to other people. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, Zach Blazanski. Lovely to speak to you. Genuinely always happy to have a, have a debate with someone. I don't, don't feel the need to agree with people. You can still have a civilised debate. Extinction Rebellion member there, if you want to go and give them your tuppence worth, in a peaceful way while they carry out their illegal, but nevertheless peaceful protests, uh, do feel free to do so. Maybe you could take part in that vote. This is Leo Varadkar going through the motions for his own country because in, increasingly in the Irish Republic, there's disquiet about the impact of no deal on the Irish economy. Yet, um, Leo Varadkar has been one of the chief architects of the hard line, which has been adopted by the EU. And I think he's really covering his back in this meeting with um, Boris Johnson today, rather than looking for a genuine compromise. I mean, if you look at his language and the way he has even ramped up uh, the rhetoric in recent days, where he has talked about... Um, a push for a united Ireland where he has insisted that Northern Ireland must, I mean, he's even dropped the idea that the backstop was an insurance policy and has made it quite clear that the backstop, which would have had Northern Ireland move to the United Kingdom, had to be a permanent arrangement. So we know that this is a man who is not really serious about trying to reach a compromise. Uh, and, and yet, it, it, given, the, given the, the option of uh, if a deal that, that involves, let's face it, a fudge over the Northern Irish Republic of Irish border, that's what it would be. Everyone knows that's what it would be. A lot, that ends up being a lot of the cases with EU deals and indeed with anything to do with Northern Ireland, let's be honest. Um, if that doesn't happen and the, and the Brexit goes through without a deal, a no-deal Brexit will result in exactly the thing that they say they fear the most, which is some sort of hard border. And you see, Julia, this is the this is the irony of all of this, because the Irish government have made preparations for a no deal. They have put legislation through the doil for a no deal, and none of those preparations and none of that legislation proposes any infrastructure along the border. And at the same time, the Irish government have made it quite clear that in the event of a no deal, they will collect taxes and duties on everything which is taxable and crosses the Irish border into the Irish Republic. And it's one of the reasons why I've claimed time and time again on your programme that this issue of infrastructure along the Irish border was always a red herring. And the Irish government has now kind of revealed that. Our concern is that the uh, House of Commons may decide to try and uh, force through the second referendum before a general election. It's quite clear that many Labour MPs, independent MPs, Liberal MPs, are petrified about losing their jobs on those cosy green benches and they'd rather have uh, as long as possible. So um, we've we've got a country that wants an election, the House of Commons that doesn't. 
Um, yes, the truth is it is playing into the Brexit Party's hands because I think uh, the country more and more is seeing that actually uh, we've got a zombie parliament that's just completely out of touch with what the people want. Are you confident that uh, a Leave could win a second referendum, assuming, of course, that Leave is on the ballot paper? As long as Leave is on the ballot paper and it's on the basis of uh, you know the previous conditions, so votes at 18, the EU citizens don't get the right to vote, then yes, I think actually Leave would win and I think we would win uh, significantly better because... Uh, you know, I think most people actually across the country, uh, you know, respect the importance of, uh, of, of trust in democracy. But the, the real issue would be uh, the nature of the campaign. It would be unbelievably divisive. It would be ugly and uh, it would be incredibly damaging to confidence and certainty. Uh, the business community would continue to pause investment and global investors would pause their, uh, you know, their, their investments into the UK. So it would be, you know, there's just no upside to a second referendum, whereas there's huge upside actually to providing the certainty of a clean break Brexit, getting it done so we can focus on domestic issues. Who's going to have to do the biggest move and make the biggest compromises? Well, look, I think um, both sides have to show a willingness to, to, to come up with a deal. We've come up with an offer, and I hope that the EU uh, enters that, uh, looks at that offer in a generous, open spirit, because we want to leave with a deal. That's a, our favourite outcome. But we've always said, this uh, new prime minister and government have always said that we were, we're prepared to leave with no deal. And that was actually the position of Theresa May. It's just that she didn't deliver on that. But, but you know, our position has always been that we want a deal, but we should be prepared to leave uh, without one. Now, I think that a deal is possible. It's going to be hard work. But I remember two months ago, I was on shows like this and people were saying, why would the, e what, the EU is never going to reopen the withdrawal agreement? You're wasting your time. Uh, this is a complete uh, waste of time. But actually what's happened in the last two months is that we have, I think, moved forward. Uh, we've come up with our proposal, which takes away the backstop. And they haven't rejected it outright. Yes, they've, had, they've said bits and pieces, and they said that you know, there's a problem here and a problem there. But they're looking at the, at the proposal. Leo Varadkar didn't come to England uh, just to talk about the weather. He's, he's coming to talk seriously about a deal. And uh, I think we can get there. Similarly, my colleague, Steve Barkley, who's the Secretary of State for DEXU, for the, the um, department leaving the, exiting the EU, he's meeting with Barnier today in Brussels. Uh, again, that, that conversation is a serious conversation and attempt to try and get a resolution okay. to this. There's now some talk that effectively Northern Ireland uh, would leave the customs union with the EU uh, along with the UK, but would continue to apply EU customs rules and tariffs on goods in a typical EU-style fudge. Do you think that's the sort of fudge that could leave us to a deal? And would that be the sort of deal that the Brexit party would stand by? No, we wouldn't. I mean, that sort of deal is, you've, you've just used the word, it's a fudge. Uh, fudges are not normally sustainable in the longer term. Um, and uh, I'm not surprised at all that all the briefing is that the concessions have been from the British side, uh, because that is how we've been approaching these negotiations from the start. Now, I had thought that Boris was doing it rather differently. He was rowing with the EU, where uh, 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 Theresa May had positively given in on almost everything. I did think he was approaching it differently. Um, if he has made major concessions, um, you've got to look at the longer term and you've got to say, well, OK, you know, you get what you call a deal. And by the way, there are lots of other things bad about that deal other than the backstop. But you get what you call a deal. Uh, but how sustainable is it in the longer term? And, and what sort of mess are we going to have with Northern Ireland working to a different set of rules uh, from the rest of the UK? So, no, I don't think you'll find anybody from the Brexit party uh, rejoicing this morning. But, you know, the, the caveat that we must all acknowledge is we haven't a clue uh, no, indeed. what this new development is. Indeed, I've spoken to a number of Eurosceptic Tories and the DUP since uh, that, that, uh, yeah. uh, that, that three-hour meeting and the, the, the idea of this pathway to a deal. And, and no information seems have leaked out. Now, the idea that the information hasn't leaked out suggests that this is a bit more serious, but also suggests, does it not, that perhaps it's something that a lot of people aren't going to be happy with. So how does this play out? Because if there is uh, some fudge and 
some semblance of a deal and Boris Johnson thinks yeah. he can sign up to something at the European Council. He returns to Parliament next Saturday on the 19th of October. Um, how do you think it's going to play out in the House of Commons? Although you, you are as an MEP, uh, you no longer sit in the House of Commons when you were a Conservative for many years. Um, in terms of how Parliament breaks down, we know it's got a Remainer uh, majority, uh, but we also know there are some Remainers, there's uh, Eurosceptics, uh, who, who, who would actually be willing to perhaps to, to sign up to a deal to avoid a no deal and avoid going on more trans, you know, more extensions, more division. Um, do you think that this sort of fudge might actually make it through Parliament? No, I don't. And, and what I would say, Julia, is what I've said to you before on this programme. The only thing that we are all agreed on is that we don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. It is utterly unpredictable. Um, as you rightly say, you know, there are all these different factions in Parliament uh, and uh, a government without a majority, uh, absolutely hamstrung by the Ben Act, uh, you've got a speaker who's uh, uh, apparently, uh, you know, willing to talk to the EU uh, behind the government's back. All these things are going on. Um, it's a complete model. And the only way out of this is to come out in a clean break. We've had three years to get ready for it. Come out in a clean break and then negotiate uh, from a position of independence. And if there are bits of that deal uh, which benefit both sides, that both sides want, then keep that as a basis but nevertheless, come out, have done with it, as Philip Hammond, of all people, originally said uh, after the referendum and after the general election in 2017. He sat there on the Mar program and said, this means we are coming out of the single market, we are coming out of the customs union. And that has got to apply to the whole UK. Um, the, in terms of what, what does emerge and how it gets agreed, yeah. there are many remainers in Parliament and we talked to a couple this morning who said, look, they'd be willing to sign up to a deal as long as it was subject to what they call a confirmatory uh, refer a vote. And therefore, obviously, a second referendum with remain on the ballot paper as well. Not a, well, here, we're leaving deal or no deal, but also having remain on the ballot. Um, would you would you in that, in the instance of a second referendum, would you in the Brexit party, would you be campaigning in that or do you think that actually that would be a referendum that you wouldn't recognise as, as having any democratic validity, in which case would you be boycotting it? Have you had discussions about that? I think uh, the campaigning that would be done would, would be to show just what a complete Hobson's choice it was. I mean, a bad deal uh, or stay in, give up, give up either way, give up or give up. Uh, and uh, that is not a choice with which the nation should be faced. I also think uh, large sections uh, of the general population would be very angry just at the idea of a second referendum. This smacks of governments over the world which have had the answer they don't want from their own people and then have just asked them the same question again. And although there would be a twist on it this time, well, we're not asking you quite the same question. Um, effectively, uh, this would be a rerun to try and get an answer that the majority of Parliament, but not the majority of the people, want. Um, and, and what about in terms of a general election? Because the big fear of the, of the Tories is that they are going to be losing Remainer Tories uh, to the Liberal Democrats and, and others perhaps. And at the same time, they're going to be losing uh, Eurosceptic Tories uh, to your party. You've been uh, polling really consistently around the 12% mark. At that percentage mark, then Boris Johnson will really struggle to get a majority, even if he does uh, maintain the Tory support he's got. He needs to beat you down to 8% or below for him to be realistically expected to deliver a majority government to be able to get Brexit through. He said, well, his office in Downing Street has said again and again and again, they will not make a formal pact with your party. They will not do a deal uh, to have effectively a lever alliance in the event of a general election. Um, how seriously do you take those, those no's, those protestations? Do you think that there will be a deal, whether formal, whether informal? And, and would the Brexit party, in the event that you believe that, say, Boris Johnson offered a manifesto saying, it's a no deal. With me, it's a no deal. I'm not going to try and negotiate anything. It's a no deal. We leave on, you know, February the 1st, whatever it is, that's it, we're out, no matter what. Would you, in that scenario, stand aside? Well, in that scenario, what we would say uh, to Boris Johnson is what we have already said, which is, look, you know, we want no deal. Um, if you want no deal, we will help you to achieve that. And one of the ways that we can do that is by standing in the Labour heartlands, uh, where people are thoroughly fed up with the Labour position on this and, and voted Brexit uh, in droves and want to see Brexit delivered, uh, we will stand there uh, and we will therefore help you uh, to get your majority, but it's got to be on the basis of a no-deal Brexit and we're not going to resile from that position. That is our position.